Good evening. Welcome to our webinar this evening, Demystifying EHV-1, uh, hosted by the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Colorado State University. Let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Jerry Black, who is Director of the Undergraduate Program in Equine Sciences at CSU. I am also uh, finishing my sixth year on the Executive Committee of the National Cutting Horse Association, as well as a trustee of the American Horse Council. To my left are other invited speakers this evening, Dr. Lutz Goring, who is Assistant Professor of Equine Internal Medicine in Clinical Sciences uh, and at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital at CSU. Uh, to my far left is Dr. Paul Lund, who is Professor and Department Head of Clinical Sciences, past President of the American Association of Veterinary Clinicians, Chairman of the Research Advisory Committee for the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. This evening we want to talk about the recent EHB1 outbreak that occurred, uh, um, or its beginning was at the NCHA Western National Championships. Uh, that uh, event was held in Ogden, Utah on uh, April 29th to May 8th, 2011. On that uh, date, at the National Championships. There were several uh, entries there, 708 to be exact, significant number of ancillary horses, meaning those horses that were there in support of the contestants, i.e. turn back horses and young horses in training. Most horses left Ogden event on or before May 8, 2011. There was a Colorado horse that participated at the Ogden event that displayed significant signs of equine herpes myeloencephalopathy and was euthanized on May 11, 2011. So we had the event uh, in Ogden. And following that event, horses dispersed to at least 21 states and provinces. Other significant facts regarding the HV1 outbreak were horses that had competed in Ogden uh, was euthanized, excuse me, one horse was euthanized at a cutting event in Central California after showing neurological signs of EHV1 on May 13, 2011. That show was immediately canceled and several hundred horses were potentially exposed uh, now, not only in Ogden, but in Central California. Uh, as a result of that exposure and cancellation of the first show, uh, the first conference call regarding cancellation of shows occurred with the Pacific Coast Cutting Horse Association cancel major shows the following week on May 19th uh, through the 22nd. Even more uh, critical time-wise was the breeder invitational cutting event was beginning in Tulsa, Oklahoma on May 13th. So that would have been one week after the uh, Ogden event. Many horses uh, were um, scheduled to compete at the breeder's invitational cutting uh, that had been in Ogden uh, and also, during that period of time, the Mercuria World Series of Cutting was canceled after the open go around, as was the Breeders' Invitational. What made that particular event unique was the fact that all the horses were on the premises uh, at the time of cancellation, and those horses were basically from all over the United States and thousand, uh, over a thousand entries uh, at the uh, Breeders' Invitational Cutting. Following that first weekend, when we knew that we had a significant outbreak from the Ogden event, the industry uh, requested that the USDA APHIS uh, offer assistance to us in surveillance beginning on Monday, May 16th. Then following several conference calls, all NCHA approved shows were canceled May 14th through June 6th of 2011. And even when they were uh, 
schedule to start again after June 6, the biosecurity measures were strongly recommended as shows reopened. So here you can see uh, of the states that had exposed horses, the number uh, that actually had EHV1 or EHM cases. And all in all, during this outbreak, as we know it now, uh, here are the statistics uh, that are relevant to the event itself. As you can tell, we had uh, a significant number of horses that uh, contracted uh, or showed confirmed uh, EHV1, and those that showed neurological signs are designated as EHM. And then the secondary or tertiary exposed horses are the horses that were exposed to horses coming home from Ogden. And you can see the number that actually displayed fever and signs of EHV virus, and then those that actually showed the neurological signs as well. All in all, we had a total of 13 deaths that were related to either primary or secondary uh, cases of EHM. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Goring, who's going to give a, a scientific presentation on EHV1. Thanks very much, and um, welcome to this uh, to this webinar. It's my first time I'm doing this, so um, maybe a little bit buttons here to uh, to push in the right direction. Uh, what I would like to talk about is um, how we think um, the neurologic form of equine herpes virus type 1 actually develops, a little bit of history beforehand, and then uh, how, does it, how does the disease develop, how to treat horses during an outbreak, and then a little bit of a background on circumstances that allow this disease to, uh, to develop or to happen. Let's see, buttons. Okay. A timeline for this, uh, for this disease, for equine herpes myelopathy, um, starts actually very early, like in the, in the 19th century already. There were, dis there were outbreaks described in Paris and in Germany uh, that looked very much like uh, equine herpes myelopathy outbreaks. However, the link between those neurologic outbreaks and um, the, um, the virus was not made at that time. That was in 1966 when um, Saxegard, um, a Norwegian veterinarian, actually had an outbreak, but was dealing with an outbreak and found the connection between virus present in the spinal cord of horses that were affected and um, the neurologic presentation. Since then, you know, it's really like every decade had its significant large-scale outbreaks, but there were still numerous other outbreaks in the meantime, and it's basically that every year has somewhere in the world has some, uh, some form of EHM outbreaks. When we look back at like the 70s and 80s, um, there were a lot of uh, farm, stud farm outbreaks. Uh, there were significant outbreaks in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, but also the National Stud Farm in, uh, in Newmarket uh, in uh, the UK was affected. There was a very famous outbreak on the Lipizzano Stud in Austria, um, in Austria. And from that point on, it seemed to have shifted a little bit more towards uh, the performance barns, to boarding facilities, to uh, training centers, uh, whether it's in the uh, standard bread area, in the warm blood area, or um, in other training centers uh, worldwide. So this disease has been described in Europe, in North America, definitely in Australia, South Africa, and Japan. We don't have reports currently from Central America and from South America, but that may be just because of uh, an, uh, an insufficient way to report this disease. If you look at a timeline, uh, if you look at a timeline of an individual horse that becomes infected with, uh, with the equine herpes virus here at this day zero, and this is our timeline here in days, if you go left to right on the screen, this would be a very typical fever curve that, uh, that occurs with uh, EHV1 infection. And because this is a European scale here with degrees Celsius, I put the blue dotted line in here that, um, that tells us above this is what we consider a fever. So this is above 101.4, 101.5 as a cutoff for fever. And we typically see when we infect horses on day one here, we typically see um, maybe a mild, a mild, moderate increase in body temperature. Sometimes there is actually a fever here, but um, 
it, it may flatten out again and is followed by this secondary wave of fever, which is um, usually way higher. It goes to 102 to 103, sometimes 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here, followed by a sudden uh, normalization here uh, after this uh, time period here. When we, um, when we look, what happens is that during this first phase of fever here, this is when virus typically replicates in the, in the upper airways, in the nose, in the throat, in the windpipe, um, and then followed by this period and after a short period of quiescence, we see all of a sudden this second uh, fever spike coming up, which is typically associated with this phenomenon of viremia when virus circulates through the blood. High fevers, and uh, we also can measure or we can detect viral virus in uh, blood white blood cells. Usually when this fever ceases, um, typically on day 10, there may be a little bit of an overlap. This is when uh, we have the, uh, the highest possibility to find neurologic horses, um, but not all horses that go through viremia will develop neurologic clinical signs. Nasal shedding, you know, this really depends on, we have these two lines in here, how much uh, viral copies are detected in nasal secretions of horses. There are two scenarios and anything is possible between those two blue lines here on the screen. And um, it's important to realize that there can be significant overlap with, uh, first of all, with a period of viremia in these horses, but also there may be more significant overlap of this nasal shedding even beyond the moment when these horses develop neurologic disease right here uh, under the red arrow. How do we get disease? How does actually this neurologic disease develop? And um, we have a few answers to this, not all answers, but we know that it is very critical, um, that it is very critical to get, I'm looking for my little arrow here, there we go, that we have this viremia going on. Viremia is when virus circulates through the blood, but in cases of equine herpes virus, this is not only, uh, this is not a free circulation of virus through the bloodstream. This is inside intracellular, inside white blood cells or leukocytes. Those virus, those virus loaded leukocytes circulate and they reach the vasculature of the uh, spinal cord. And uh, the vasculature of the spinal cord has endothelial cells here as inner lining of the cells. These, um, these um, virus loaded white blood cells make contact with those endothelial cells and allow virus to jump ship to go over into the endothelial cell here. Uh, and this is how this, probably, how this problem here starts with um, endothelial infection of those small vessels in the spinal cord. To the left here, this is actually a million dollar picture here where we can see the inner lining of a blood cell here, which is this blue um, one line of cells here that goes around this, um, this uh, blood vessel here, and we have virus-loaded white blood cells here just attaching to the endothelial cells. We know they are virus-positive because they stain for virus. This is the brown stain that is in there, and this is, um, uh, this is just the moment we assume before virus jumps ships, a ship before it infects the endothelial cells. So we're looking at those small vessels here that crisscross all along the spinal cord here. This is a cross section of a spinal cord in a drawing here. And um, we have those endothelial cells here that are infected. Virus starts to replicate here. And um, virus may also spread left and right within those endothelial cells and maybe one cell layer beyond that stage. Again, here is an immunohistochemistry, a, a stain that shows virus in those endothelial cells, um, uh, having those cells infected. And the next step would be that this infection of endothelial cells definitely causes disruption. It causes inflammation of those cells. Small vessels, um, uh, these endothelial cells will spread out here. There, there is activation of the coagulation cascade. There's inflammation over those uh, endothelial cells in, within that vessel, activates the coagulation cascade, and you see that clots or thrombi are formed, which um, can occlude vasculature. And whenever that happens, so if vasculature in the spinal cord becomes occluded, what happens is that the, the, the tissue behind a blood vessel like that where all our neurons 
and nervous tissue actually is located is deprived of oxygen and nutrients. So it may die off, but definitely it will become um, significantly damaged. This is very similar what's described in humans um, um, in cases of strokes or brain stroke. The only difference in the horse is that this, uh, by the majority, takes place in the spinal cord and um, has been described by Eddington and Bridges in, uh, in 1986 as equine stroke. Unfortunately, these are the bad pictures to show in a severe case of um, EHM where we see here in, the, in blue, we see macroscopic, we see cross-sections through a spinal cord with huge areas of bleeding in here. And um, it's very easy to understand that this is compressive, these are compressive lesions for a spinal cord for neurons. And definitely understandable that these neurons cannot function with all that inflammation going on. This is a blood vessel here where cells migrated into the tissue. There's a clot here right in the middle which shows um, uh, the decreased perfusion of blood through this vessel and definitely uh, impaired function. Um, neuronal cell death, so cell death of uh, nerve cells here with hemorrhage in here, which is the, the red little dot in here. Cells that move into this tissue and uh, cause um, uh, worsening of inflammation in, those, in, those, in that tissue. Because this is disease that can happen from the brain stem, from the brain stem up here all the way through the spinal cord on several different locations, all those tracts that uh, connect the hind limbs, the forelimbs with the brain, where the brain is uh, all of a sudden unable to tell where the limbs should go. Um, they don't also receive the information from those limbs um, where they are in space. Uh, we definitely see those clinical signs of uh, EHM that uh, can be summarized as incoordination or ataxia. Usually we also see stiffness. We see weakness. These horses uh, drag their toes. They may even become uh, completely recumbent um, and they're unable to rise. But what's definitely important to understand with this disease is even if there is mild disease when it comes to gait abnormalities, there's one long track that, that goes from the brain up here all the way to the bladder here in the back. And um, this is a track that uh, tells the bladder neck when it actually needs to open. And if this track is uh, damaged, the, uh, the sphincter of the bladder cannot open. So there's a lot of dysuria going on. So one of the most important findings or clinical signs you will encounter with this disease is the inability of horses to urinate. And it needs to be addressed when it comes to, uh, to this uh, stage of disease. Rarely there's cranial nerve involvement, so we've seen head tilts and we've seen, um, we've seen uh, yeah, cranial nerve uh, deficiencies, but they are, they're definitely a rare phenomena. Going back to this uh, overview slide, what happens during several stages of this disease, we can say that there are horses that have uh, nasal shedding. Uh, without any further disease, we have definitely horses that, um, we have a horse that uh, may be in the viremic phase, uh, here between days, usually days five to day 10. And then followed, uh, following the viremia, we have the phase of neurologic disease. And all these three different um, disease components of EHM or the previous clinical signs need to be addressed differently. So I would like to wrap it up from the, the, the back to the front. I would like to start with the neurologic horse. What can we do with these horses? What have we done in the past? Definitely there is a need for supportive care for these horses. Um, there is, um, we need to isolate these horses because uh, likely that they still shed virus into the environment which may be contagious to other horses. It's, um, it is advised to stall rest these horses because they, uh, they may stagger, they may fall if they are exercised. Even a, a little hand walk uh, may be too much for these horses to experience. Also, transportation usually worsens clinical signs upon arrival um, uh, at a clinic or wherever they go. And um, so sometimes it becomes necessary to put horses in a support sling to just make sure they, uh, they do not fall down or they are stabilized um, in, in a stall. Um, in a stall. Definitely other important things is this bladder catheterization. We have to make sure these horses are able to avoid urine. 
antibiotic use is uh, advocated as supportive care and definitely fluid support and nutritional support is necessary for these horses because there will be a certain time period of these three, four, five days where these horses can be quite um, um, uh, high maintenance, if you call it that way. There is a, a very important need for anti-inflammatory drugs in these horses, and there are two types of uh, anti-inflammatories we usually give to horses. They are the non-steroidals, which, um, which are drugs we would consider like, um, like ibuprofen in, uh, in uh, people. Uh, in horses, these, uh, the medications are uh, either Equiox or Banamin. Everybody is probably very familiar with Banamin, definitely with Butte. But Butte to treat a neurologic horse with um, probably has the least, uh, least efficacy here. I would definitely go for Equiox or for Banamin. Equiox definitely has the advantage that it's safe to administer. It also helps to, um, it's only a once a day treatment. So I definitely would go for Equiox. It helps to decrease the swelling in the um, spinal cord. It helps to, um, uh, to restore the functionality of neurons. And definitely it can be helped by corticosteroids, but um, uh, in my opinion, they, they need to be given in a, in a, at a low dose regimen for about two, maybe three days and not on long stretch, stretches. We usually advise to give a non steroid for several days to come up to 10, 14 days, definitely corticosteroids for less um, time period than that, maybe like two or three days. Additional anti-inflammatory effect may come from those DMSO uh, infusions. Uh, however, they are considered more an osmotic, so they drain fluid out of tissue, um, and uh, they may not have that, uh, that big anti-inflammatory effect that mainly comes through those two other drugs. When it comes to antiviral um, uh, treatments, I think there is, a, um, there is a residual benefit to treating the neurologic horse with uh, antivirals because there's still replication of virus going on in those endothelial cells of the uh, spinal cord. However, latest research uh, um, through um, uh, Dr. Maxwell from the University of Oklahoma has shown that there is an advantage at that stage to, uh, to give um, a drug called gancyclovir over valacyclovir because it has a more rapid uh, way to, to reach um, a steady state and to reach uh, those, the, the blood vessels in the spinal cord. But definitely the antiviral uh, treatment may have benefits here in uh, treating even uh, to treat the neurologic horse even if um, uh, the delivery of virus has already occurred. Restorative further treatments, vitamin E, vitamin B, over several weeks to come from this time point on because once we will know when uh, the utmost uh, rehabilitation has been reached, we will know that after about, well, sometimes three to six months following this acute insult of neurologic disease. If you go one step forward and we look at the febrile horse, which is very likely to be uh, the horse that is viremic under outbreak conditions, same things are applicable when it comes to supportive care and definitely a close watch is advised for these horses. They also need to be isolated. They also benefit from some stall rest. It also helps to segregate horses. And uh, it is very important to make sure you pay attention to regular urination and defecation of these horses. It may be an early indicator that something is wrong with the horse um, and uh, maybe indeed an early indicator. It is very, it's even more important to have these horses on anti-inflammatory drugs and we talk here strictly about non steroidal so don't use corticosteroids at that stage. Definitely non steroidal drugs are important because we feel or we believe based on in vitro experiments we've done so far is that um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they interfere with those molecules that are sitting on the surface of those endothelial cells in vessels and they may interfere with uh, the adherence of white blood cells that are loaded with virus. Um, so they interfere with the adherence there and they may interfere with that jump ship phenomenon of virus coming out of the white blood cell into the endothelial cell. In addition to that, definitely antivirals, yes, 
very important, again, because overall, whether a virus replicates in the nasal mucosa, whether it replicates in the lymph nodes, um, or whether it replicates in those white blood cells on their journey through the body before reaching those endothelial cells, antivirals will bring down the amount of virus um, tremendously, and it will decrease that possibility of uh, infection of those endothelial cells. Restorative, I think there's nothing wrong with giving vitamin E as a precaution. It always takes a while before vitamin E, vitamin B reaches significant levels in the body, so it's, it's good to start early on. So maybe the entire barn may benefit from, um, from vitamin E, vitamin B administrations at that point. What do we do with a non-febrile, non-neurologic course? Definitely, again, supportive care and important observation. It is important to take these rectal temperatures at least twice daily, and I think we should be on the watch for a lower cutoff when it comes to what do we call a fever. Very often, horses that replicate virus in their, in their upper airways actually do not have uh, what we officially would call a fever, something above 101.4, 101.5, but these horses do increase with their rectal temperatures to about uh, by a degree or one and a half degrees, and we should be concerned if all of a sudden a horse that usually has a temperature of 99.9 .9 all of a sudden comes with temperatures of 100.8 or 101. Um, I'm, I'm not um, convinced that at this point, it, um, it, 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 whether it's truly beneficial to put these horses on antiviral therapy, it may also be a very costly uh, thing to do. Um, but uh, definitely there is viral replication in, uh, in the nasal mucosa and it may interfere at that point. It may interfere also with developing into that stage of viremia. So now we are going back from uh, what happens in the individual horse, what happens in the three stages of how do we get disease here. Let's go back and see what actually happens on a farm if, um, if, an, uh, if a horse that encounters, virus, um, that encounters a virus and brings that virus onto a farm, how, uh, how disease progresses from that point on. We have very often in all those outbreaks that occurred around the world, there's typically um, the, the story that there is an index case. An index case is that horse that brings in virus usually from an event. This is a, usually a, a competitive event. It's a, a heavy training session, but there are also descriptions out there when it comes to a sale event or when a horse comes from a sale. And usually this is the horse that brings in disease. It has, a, it has a fevers a few days, a few days later on. And it's not necessarily that Ogden is the first, uh, the first uh, uh, description of an outbreak where several horses return to their home premises. There have been other descriptions before by one of our, um, of our good colleagues here in Belgium, where from one competition, several horses went back home to their home premises and caused uh, EHM on at least 10 other premises. Once the index case is in the barn, uh, it's not the classic thing what we see, for example, with a flu, that really disease jumps from one horse to the other like a fire going through a barn. It is more this, uh, this um, uh, gradual development. So we have our index case here coming up in yellow. And then a few days later, we have more horses with fevers, more horses with neurologic disease. Then there is uh, a period of quiet time. And then all of a sudden, we see another little cluster of, of horses. But really, randomly, somewhere between, uh, spread, out, uh, spread out over the um, surface of um, what is just got a time, a time limit here. Um, and when we look at all these different outbreaks, uh, I think when we pile up all the numbers, um, if we look at 50 horses in a barn like that, there are, um, there are actually maybe on average about half of them, so maybe like 25 horses that will develop that viremic fever in the second run. So there are definitely horses on a farm that do not develop, um, that do not develop um, uh, fevers. They may not develop viremia or they may not develop a viremia that is, that is very high 
in its occurrence. And from those 25 uh, horses that develop viremia, there is only a fraction actually that um, that will develop neurologic disease. And these are our this is like a rough number, which about 10. And from those 10 horses, two may come down with a worst form of EHM, where they become uh, recumbent, um, where they become recumbent. We have a few risk factors out there, actually. This is a disease that more likely happens in winter and spring, and it typically happens more commonly in the tall breeds. Warm blood, standard bred, quarter horse, thoroughbred, and in uh, the draft horse, and it's actually less likely to happen in pony breeds. It's also less likely to happen in horses that are younger than three years of age, which is a very interesting phenomenon, and a lot of our research actually focuses on this uh, on this. Um, discrepancy in how disease presents. Um, these risk factors also may show that our distribution of diseases, so if we have still 50 horses on a farm, 25 horses that develop viremia, that develop a fever, that we have, depending on how the farm or how the, the premises look like, what type of horses are there, um, we will get in a boarding facility uh, of middle-aged horses, warm bloods, we will get a higher number of neurologic uh, cases in here. While we have, if we look at the pony breeds, here if we have um, um, Shetland pony breeds, we definitely have um, a tremendously low number of uh, neurologic diseases, if at all. Um, I, I think I kind of skipped this one to uh, Dr. Lunn. Um, for the presentation before going for the diagnostics here, we can do that in the, in the Question session okay. would hand on the, um, the pointer here. Thanks, to you. Thanks very much. Um, so, so we can get to the questions. Let me just take a few issues that I think are uh, particularly challenging. One of the major questions people ask and want to know about this most recent outbreak: Why is this outbreak different? Why is it so much more severe? Uh, is one of the contributing factors uh, that this is a mutant virus? And this is a common question, and it's a difficult issue to address. And the shortest answer is no. What happened in Ogden is probably not a new mutation in EHV1. This is a kind of virus that is very stable, doesn't mutate at anything like the frequency influenza would. Nevertheless, uh, some years ago, perhaps seven years ago, researchers from around the world studying viruses isolated from cases of abortion, which herpes virus causes, and neurological disease, discovered a single molecular change. In the, D, in the DNA, a single molecular change uh, that was strongly associated with whether the virus came from a case of neurological disease or not. Now, they labeled these two strains, the N752 that came from abortion and the D that came from neurological cases. And you may be more familiar with terms like non-neuropathogenic or neuropathogenic. Now, certainly the virus that caused the outbreak in Ogden that spread around North America has been proven uh, already by a number of individuals and confirmed recently by some colleagues of, uh, of ours at the University of Kentucky to be of the uh, neuropathogenic form. But let me, let me remind you for a moment, if we look at this diagram of how herpes moves around in horses, on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the environment in which herpes commonly spreads amongst horses. In young uh, populations, within a week or two of birth until weaning, herpes spreads incredibly common, such that the great majority of her horses in the world get exposed and become infected. And when you get infected with a herpes virus, you typically become latently infected, infected for life. If we were to look at a population of horses, and there's a schematic here with 20 horses on the bottom, and if we imagine that all of these horses were exposed early in life to herpes virus and were latently infected lifelong with herpes virus 1, how many of them would normally, naturally carry the neuropathogenic form, technically the D752, but the, the dangerous form, if you like? Well, the answer is, in a group of 20, probably are anywhere from two to four. We've got three showing up with red stars here, about 15%. And you can, as shown at the top of the screen, get diagnostic tests that can distinguish between the so-called neuropathogenic and non-neuropathogenic form. The question really is, how much, how much value does that information have for you as you manage a case of this disease? The problem being that the association is not absolute. 
it is true that the D form, the neuropathogenic form, more commonly causes neurological disease, but the N form can also cause this kind of a disease. So not all of the cases of neurological disease we see are caused by, are caused by the D. What proportions carry the D? Probably naturally about 5 to 20, maybe 15 percent. Testing has some value to your veterinarian, but you shouldn't condemn a horse with EHV1 just on the basis of having the D form. This is quite common in, uh, this is quite common in, the, in the natural horse population. In fact, a little bit more information about this. When you do have an outbreak, you usually find one strain or the other, and clearly it's more commonly the neuropathogenic form in this kind of outbreak. The idea has been proposed at the end, the non-neuropathogenic form is the original strain, and we're seeing a recent mutation. Well, this isn't the case. You can find the D form in isolates from the 50s and 60s, and other herpes viruses like EHV4, they have that D form as well. Another idea I've seen bandied about is that EHV1 can mutate from one form to the other in a single for horse, and this just does not happen. It is true, though, that the prevalence of these strains is changing, the relative percentage of each, so maybe this does have something to do with the number of outbreaks we have seen in the last uh, 10 years. So still a lot to learn about this mutant uh, concept. Let's talk quickly about vaccination to protect against equine herpes virus. This diagram that was drawn originally by George Allen at the University of Kentucky depicts how um, herpes virus, seen here on the left hand of your left hand side of your screen, infects originally the respiratory epithelium, if I can get some control over this mouse, and subsequently gets inside lymphocytes, which travel to a local lymph node and finally result in that viremia that uh, my colleague Lutz Goering talked about but a moment ago. Now the immune system can only uh, really impact this at the surface of the respiratory uh, epithelium when antibody on the surface can affect the virus. Uh, before the virus gets into uh, lymphocytes and causes the viremia, antibody can also have an impact. But the truth of the matter is that of the different kinds of immunity we have against EHV1, antibody in the nose, antibody in the blood, these have a very limited effect against this virus, and we really need a very complicated uh, type of an immune cell, it's called a cytotoxic T lymphocyte, to get good protection. And unfortunately, these are very hard to generate using the kinds of vaccines that are available to us today. If we look at the American Association of Equine Practitioner Guidelines, this is the conventional advice for using EHV1 vaccines. We vaccinate pregnant mares to prevent abortion, and we vaccinate the rest of the population with a primary course uh, given perhaps at about six months of age, and then with boosters at a 12-month interval or a six-month interval. But this really only has an effect against the respiratory disease we see at a mild respiratory disease with EHV1. It simply doesn't protect at this time against neurological disease. There are a number of products that are available out there. Some of them are licensed for respiratory disease. Uh, these include some killed vaccines you may recognize. There's a modified live vaccinated for the same purpose. And there are two vaccines licensed for control of abortion. We've made a lot of studies in our research group and Lutz and I and our other colleagues uh, over the years. And what we've learned is that the products licensed to control abortion typically outperform the respiratory products. They make much stronger antibody responses. So some years ago, we proposed using the abortion vaccines more widely. More recently, we've done challenge trials where we challenged horses with herpes, and we've learned that not only the uh, abortion vaccines, but also the modified live rhinomune and one enhanced adjuvant vaccine called Calvenza from Boehringer, these have the best effect. They can decrease shedding of virus at the nose, they can reduce viremia, but what they cannot do is prevent EHV1 infection. They don't give complete protection. So at this time, this may be part of the reason, they cannot prevent the occurrence of EHM. The best vaccines can reduce nasal shedding and perhaps viremia, but nothing can stop EHM. And the best performance is when they've been boosted within as little as one to two months. So if you encounter an outbreak of EHV1, do you want to vaccinate in the face of it? 
It's a tough question. I would say it may decrease the spread and the shed of the virus. So this could help you uh, limit this virus moving around in your barn or even entering the barn. But you must do it early. Once the virus has entered the facility, there's really no point. And in fact, moving the horses, mixing them, if you have to do that when you vaccinate, could really make things worse. So let's wrap up uh, this presentation with a brief discussion of biosecurity, something we could easily have dedicated the whole hour to. But let's hit some of the high points of how, without vaccines, we can control this, vac this virus moving around on our farms. For many years, we worked under the principles that it's very important to subdivide the population on your farm. This was advice devised for the breeding operation, but it can be applied to any, for any farm. If you can cut up your horses, if you have 100 horses, if you can manage them as smaller herds, if you like, keeping them at some level biosecure from each other, if herpes virus does get in, it might give you a chance to restrict it to one part of your farm stopping it from getting into your farm. This is a key thing. And here is a lesson from Ogden. It was so unfortunate that horses that were shedding the virus moved from Ogden with nobody knowing and nobody really having a chance to know. And quarantine was not done when those horses moved to new events. There was no increased uh, risk um, knowledge, if you like. We didn't know there was a greater risk after that event, and subsequently the virus spread. Perhaps if there's anything we can learn from this occurrence, it's that we should routinely attempt to quarantine horses as much as we can when they come away from any event at any time. I will take a moment here, though, to uh, make the point, which I think is an important one, that the NCHA deserves enormous credit the way they immediately responded within hours of learning about this outbreak, cancelling the shows, as Dr. Black told us uh, earlier at the beginning of this uh, presentation, and I am confident significantly reducing how bad this outbreak might have been if they had not acted. The other thing we can do is to maximize immunity and to vaccinate, as I described. This slide that uh, our colleague, Dr. Paul Morley, from our department, shared with us gives you some more specific information uh, in the face of an outbreak, what you might do. Another way of looking at this then is stop exposing um, un uninfected horses to uh, horses that might be shedding this virus. Focus on horse-to-horse -horse contact. That could be nose-to-nose -nose contact. It could be your hands, your clothing, the tack and equipment. We know this virus can spread through the air, but it can also spread on physical surfaces. Prevent the excessive spread of, horses from in, of virus from infected horses. Spot them early. If you're in a high-risk situation, be taking temperatures. Routinely isolate the animals and decontaminate, clean and disinfect. All of these things can contribute. And as you work with an outbreak on a farm, remember, communication and education is critical. You need to tell your owners, if you're somebody who owns a boarding farm, you need to talk carefully to the people who work on your farm. Not all of them may know uh, as much as you might about this, and it's essential they fully understand the different ways that the virus could move around. Finally, high-risk courses and situations. Every one of the outbreaks uh, we've talked about, Ogden being a clear example, there is a, a, uh, almost invariably an event such as a horse moving on and off the premises, coming home from a show, a sale, or an event. These are the times, these are really how EHM outbreaks occur. Isolate those horses routinely. Check their temperatures. Do that, please, before you expose them to the rest of your herd. And febrile horses, continue to isolate them for a few days, even when we're not in the middle of a uh, neurological disease storm. And do remember that if you have a case of um, herpes virus myeloencephalitis, they are the horses that shed the most virus. Got to treat them with great care. When people are trying to end quarantine, as some of our listeners uh, this evening may have recently uh, experienced, it can be a long wait before the uh, state veterinarian or your own veterinarian or even you yourself, if you're policing your own farm, know when to end the quarantine. And waiting as long as 28 days, which is the current AAEP recommendation, that can be tough to do. Sometimes what people do is they wait a period, perhaps 14 days. If they don't have new sick horses, they will try and test out 
That is to say, test all of the horses on the farm using the most modern technology, which is a real-time PCR assay. Now, to do that is expensive, typically around $55 per horse. UC Davis Lab charges around 57 right now. Kentucky charges 55 if you're in-state, 85 if you're out-of-state, and IDEX are around that mark too. So, in fact, the attraction of getting out of a quarantine soon may be very strong, but it's sometimes cheaper just to wait. And obviously, this is a, a really an issue of risk aversion, how soon you're going to end that quarantine. I would strongly advise not before 21 days, a discussion to have with your veterinarian. I'm going to hand back for the last slide to uh, Dr. Lutz Goering to wrap this up this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So just some concluding points. Again, uh, current vaccinations are very important and are the cornerstone of uh, helping to prevent the spread of EH1 among horses. Future vaccines, definitely. So there will be, there, there is more development necessary here, but future vaccines will focus on uh, actually on diminishing this viremia, which is the key to develop uh, neurologic disease. And, but until then, or in, in combination with uh, vaccination, the biosecurity measures are equally, at least equally important, if not even more important at this current stage in preventing the creation of an index case and also in preventing spread on premises. Okay. We have a future vision for CSU to support the equine industry and um, we are actually already a leader in um, a leader, an international leader, actually in EHV1 research and EHM research. We do a lot of vaccine studies. We development, um, we developed um, quite some interesting and very efficacious in vitro models to study this disease, uh, how di how this disease actually is caused and how does it uh, how does it happen. And we are currently testing existing drugs and also new drugs that come on the market, um, how they can be used in, uh, in EHM prevention. Um, uh, we also have currently the plans to develop CSU into the top institute in the region for equine neurologic disease research to address diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis prevention, not only of EHV1, but also of any other, uh, any other um, neurologic disease in horses. And um, through a very generous donation from out of our equine community here, we recently established this equine neurology disease, neurologic disease fund and I just would like to bring to your attention that uh, this is clinically applied research to address EHV1 and other neurologic diseases, purchase of the most advanced diagnostic um, modalities, treatment modalities, and funds associated for staff training, um, facility renovation, expansion associated with caring for neurologic cases, especially those that, um, that um, have an infectious uh, cause, so they need to be isolated. I think we um, could go to the question section here, and uh, Dr. Black will be able to uh, moderate these. Thank you, Dr. Goring. <clears throat> we do apologize for rushing through the presentation due to the technical difficulties we had at the start, but we do have uh, time for questions that have been submitted to us. The first question is actually from a uh, uh, veterinary teaching hospital client, Ellen Oman from Fort Lupton, Colorado, and her question of you doctors is how long does the virus last on external surfaces, such as tack, buckets, hitching rails, stalls, et cetera? Uh, Jerry, let me try and take that. This, this was a question that came up very early in this outbreak, um, and I actually dug back through the literature to try and find what I might, and there are papers that suggest it can last on surfaces as long as three weeks and as long on, on, on horse hair as long as 30 days. Having said that, those might be the most uh, extreme cases. This is a, uh, an envelope DNA virus. What that means is that it, it's really pretty easy to kill. UV light will destroy it, uh, disinfectants, soaps, detergents, these things will easily dis destroy it. So with disinfection and cleaning, you can radically reduce those times. 
Um, I would say that cleaning is the key. Uh, if you have an area you really can't clean and if it's in the dark and kind of moist and there's no way to properly clean it, then it might be sensible to try and not use that area for three or four weeks. But that would be an extreme case. Thank you, Dr. Lund. We have a, another question from um, Veterinary Teaching Hospital clients, Robert and Teresa Alcorn from Wellington, Colorado. And their question is, where are we at in understanding the cause of this sudden outbreak? What is the likelihood of this being spread to the outlying areas or to wildlife such as elk, deer, or antelope, and or mustangs, as well as domestic herds? What are the chances that people can spread or carry this virus on them? Okay, and I take this question. Uh, uh, so the sudden occurrence of outbreaks, definitely there is this stress component to this where we always assume that horses, when they go to shows, they, um, they may allow virus to come out of latency and may um, replicate initially in the respiratory tract uh, of this uh, of the stressed animal and from there on it's an easy way to spread virus left and right on a horizontal basis from one host to the other. So definitely there's this stress component in there that is of importance in uh, our understanding why these outbreaks occur quite suddenly. The likelihood of spreading to uh, wildlife uh, in my opinion, it's quite, uh, quite, it's, it's non-existing, not non-existing, but um, um, it's, it's marginal. We don't think that uh, equine herpes virus replicates in uh, elk, deer, antelope. Um, and again, it's a lazy virus. It's uh, an envelope virus that, that needs close contact for transmission. So any, it's not a virus that flies through the air like uh, some others do. So it's unlikely that um, this actually will spread into the wildlife and mustang population. Llamas? Oh yes. Um, so there is the only other. So I just got from uh, from uh, Dr. Dr. Lun here the question on uh, on llama population, alpaca population. Um, this virus has been um, has been uh, identified in llamas and alpacas already, um, but. Um, there's always question about whether this was actually EHV1 that replicates or whether this was an, uh, a, a different subtype of uh, equine herpes virus. But um, definitely at this point, we can't rule it out completely. So this would be a, a population of animals we may consider susceptible until proven otherwise. Thank you. Next question is from CSU alumna Jackie Moranti from uh, Eden, Colorado. Her question is, and I quote, I have horses that have been out of state during the recent outbreak. What do I need to do to keep them safe from exposure when I bring them back? They're currently on remote ranches in Kansas and Wyoming. Nothing has gone off or on these ranches since November of 2010. Um, okay. So um, I think that would be uh, something very comparable. If you if you don't have any horse movements there, it's it's really unlikely that um, you will have introduction of horses um, uh, in your in your herd in your premises. Um, however, these horses may have they may be carrier, and you know they may have at some point they may upregulate virus. So you you may find some antibodies in these horses um, and presence of horses, but I think the risk is really really. Um, it's really, really small that you will have uh, problems of herpes virus in your herd if you don't have any exchange with other horses. I think at this time, Jerry, you know, one of the key things is that um, there is so little evidence of this virus spreading around. I think it's now been more than a month. Would that be right, look, since we had a new case occur in Colorado? So May 13th was yeah. the first. Oh, so, well. um, yeah. I think it's uh, it's certainly getting on towards that. So you know the index of risk right now is is, is much less than it than it might be, um, and I don't I think the USDA the last time the USDA updated updated its website was Thursday of last week. It's been over a week since they'd seen uh, or had a case reported in in uh, the United States at least. Um, and consequently, uh, they're not going to do any further updates to the site. So we're probably back to the, the normal situation where normal levels of biosecurity uh, would be appropriate at this time. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Question is from uh, Dr. Curtis Ng, who's an industry professional from Los Angeles, California. 
His question is, do they know of any cases of the CHV1 crossing species lines and affecting other animals? Do they feel this is possibly given that other equine herpes virus have jumped species? I think it's uh, probably both of us will, will try this. I think uh, Lutz's answer a minute ago uh, addressed this in part. I mean, there is the, the uh, concern with camelids, with llamas and with alpacas. Uh, in those animals, uh, it was suspected that if it was herpes virus that caused it, that it was a, um, an ocular disease and a, and a pretty sporadic one. Um, you can certainly infect some other species uh, with EHV1. I think we've even seen it in cows. Technically, they can become infected, but to actually cause disease uh, is uncommon. Uh, we've seen it in some zoological species, in zebras, I believe. Uh, there's one or two case reports. But it's largely, uh, to a very, very large degree, it's an equine pathogen. You do need to be concerned about it in donkeys and in mules, most certainly. Um, but beyond that, it's really a disease of, of an infection of the, horse, of the horse, at least in terms of causing sickness. Good. This question comes from a horse owner, Chris Masters, from Longmont, Colorado. Her question is, other than isolating my horse, how do I avoid contamination? What are early signs that my horse may be in trouble? Well, maybe I'll start this one. I think we've uh, we've, we've we've covered this a, a little bit, uh, Chris. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, horses uh, live a social life. Uh, they actually, more than any other animal, they they live a life life like us. Uh, they've got a home, but many of them travel uh, to compete. Uh, they even travel uh, internationally to compete. They even travel internationally to date, if you like. Uh, breeding takes them all around the country, all around the world, or all around uh, your region. And they need to live that kind of a life. Um, owners enjoy it, and we believe that for the most part the horses enjoy it too. Uh, so it's not really practical um, in the world in which we live to keep them in cotton wool. And, and at this time we really think this risk has fallen away to a normal uh, level. But just as you would with uh, your, your, your children, for example, um, you should be concerned. You would be concerned in an animal that's susceptible to disease, disease for which we don't have a great vaccine right now to try and protect them. And simple measures, simple hygiene measures, if you're going to a show, going to an event, um, take your own water uh, container to water your horse. Uh, fill it from a tap. Uh, if there's a hose on that tap, don't let that hose trail in the bucket because that hose might have contacted another bucket. Take your own feed containers, your own tack, um, and if you're going to share a stall, uh, that stall really should have been cleaned before you moved into it. This won't completely protect you, but these kinds of measures can greatly reduce, uh, can greatly reduce the, uh, the risk of getting exposed. And when you bring a horse back on the farm, uh, do your best to keep it in uh, a somewhat remote area just for a few days, at, at the very least, until you can be confident it's, uh, it's not showing any signs of ill health. And this works just as much for herpes virus as it does for strangles, uh, which would be another really common thing we'd want to keep off our farms as horses return to them. That leads to another question by horse owner Teresa Dalgert from Arvada, Colorado. This uh, is you've answered most of this, Dr. Lund, but um, her question was, how can I, uh, what can I do while attending equine events to minimize exposure risk from my horses, which I think you've covered pretty adequately. But one of the questions we were asked regularly during the outbreak is, what kind of disinfectants will actually kill the virus? I think Dr. Lund already mentioned that, that, um, that uh, with answering another question, so detergent soaps already break uh, break open virus or kill virus, so just by splitting open that envelope that surrounds the virus itself, but definitely any type of um, uh, um, chlorine, dilute chlorine definitely would kill virus, but definitely also detergents and um, um, vi virucidal disinfectants as labeled. Yeah, some good examples. Uh, Vercon is a product that you uh, you would commonly find uh, used as a disinfectant, very effective against herpes virus. A whole group of compounds we call phenolic compounds. You'll see many labeled products at a farm and ranch store that will contain uh, that kind of a disinfectant. Phenolics are very good, even if you can't fully clean 
uh, a stall. You can still use phenolics. And also uh, quaternary ammonium compounds. That's another kind of a label you would see on a number of products you'd find in your local farm and ranch store or in your hardware store. So these would be uh, all be great examples. Good old soap and water will do an awful lot to decontaminate and get you most of the way there as well. Often uh, we're asked about use of chlorine bleach. Um, and I think in the literature, uh, in some of the uh, horse publications, they recommend 10% uh, bleach. Do you think that's adequate? Well, it is. Uh, if you had a clean concrete surface and there was nothing on it but herpes virus, uh, any amount of hypochlorite, any amount of bleach will uh, uh, pretty much uh, instantly take out that virus. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's pretty rare we have surfaces that are that clean. There's often other uh, material present that we can't entirely eliminate. And bleach uh, likes to destroy anything that's organic, and it will feed just as much on the horse manure, on the, uh, the straw, on hay, as it will on the virus. That, that, uh, that equine ambulance uh, passes by there. So uh, bleach is a great thing in an environment that you've really decontaminated and cleaned up very much uh, in advance. And if you've even got wooden material um, that your stalls are built from, you know, the bleach will uh, want to attack that as much as it wants to attack the virus. So except in the circumstances you've got a clean, co clean concrete floor, there may be better choices. Uh, the Vercons, phenolics, and quaternary ammonium compounds give you an added margin of safety. Good. Well, we do have time for one more question, and uh, I have a question from Mickey Althaus from Colorado Springs, who's a horse owner. And his question is, I've read that HEV1 is latent by nature. Are tests available to determine if a horse without symptoms is carrying the disease in a dormant state? Also, with this potential for latency in mind, how can horse owners and horse facilities adequately assess when the potential for exposure has passed? It seems many clubs and organizations, including the BLM, are moving forward with horse events. Well, maybe we'll uh, all of us have a, bite at, uh, have a bite at this one. This is the most challenging question you've asked, um, and it is an excellent one. Um, there are tests that you can do to determine if a horse is latently infected. <coughs> and there have been many studies done in many countries, including North America, to run those tests. And while results vary, the number of horses that are latently infected is typically surprisingly high. The more sensitive your test, uh, the higher that result becomes. And personally, my attitude is if I meet a horse, it's very likely to be a horse that is latently infected with EHV1. Uh, so this is a, a normal condition of being a horse, and it, it won't be the only herpes virus that they're infected with. Um, we are no different as humans. As mammals, we are also infected with multiple herpes viruses throughout our life, sometimes viruses we know the names of, like the one that co causes cold sores, but let's just say, if you are a mammal, it's normal to have herpes viruses in the horse. That often means EHV1. As I showed in the cartoon uh, with the 20 horses, uh, I try to indicate that as many as anywhere from 5 to 20% of those infections, those normal latent infections, could be with viruses with the, uh, the likelihood of uh, the capacity to cause neurological disease. So the key issue is, having been exposed to this virus does not make that horse a threat for the remainder of its life. We really do not have a, a recorded instance, to my knowledge, to date, where a horse that was involved in an outbreak of neurological disease at some time in the past, uh, two months, three months, five years, whatever it might be, subsequently initiated another outbreak in the future. So at this point, there is no evidence through 50 years of study that these horses exposed in the most recent outbreak represent a threat in the future and normal service and normal use can be uh, can continue and we can treat these horses normally. I'm going to hand off to Lutz to comment on that point because it's a very controversial but very important question. I think we've seen in the past, we've seen a few outbreaks or I, I heard from a few outbreaks I followed actually, let's say 10 years ago and the, the the veterinarian on that farm called me like five years later and they said like we had a second outbreak on the same farm 
but um, to his surprise, um, it always it, these were always the new horses that came from other from other areas that brought in virus and also went through all this disease. While the horses that originally went through the outbreak did not flinch, they did not show any clinical signs, no fevers, no neurologic disease. And I believe once they um, they go through infection, they are protected for um, a significant number of years uh, to go through another round of um, of each one infection. It's probably a better immunity than what we ever get with vaccines at this point. So they may be latently infected, but I think there's also an add-on of, of the host's immune system to contain that, um, that latent infection where it, where it actually happens. And um, I believe um, the likelihood that these horses will shed virus in the near future is, is very, very small, but we definitely need way more research on that particular subject or um, on that particular aspect of um, uh, EHV1 infections. Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Lung and Dr. Goring for an excellent presentation tonight. And we'd like to thank you for the uh, attending our webcast this evening. If you have any uh, outstanding questions, please contact us. Uh, we have Dr. Goring's information up here or our uh, information line at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital at Colorado State. Again, thank you and good evening.